Good evening, folks. This is Wayne Carter, and uh, I'm here with Faith That Works. And I hope you're ready to join me tonight as we continue our study in the Book of Romans. Hope you've had a good week also. Uh, great weather this week, and uh, even though it's been a little windy, uh, the temperatures have been outstanding compared to what they were last year about this time. Um, so I hope your heart is warm tonight as we get ready to study God's Word. And uh, we're going to be in the chapter uh, 5 of uh, the book of Romans. And so let me just back up a little bit to what we talked about last week as we finished our uh, per, uh, show Paul was speaking directly to the Jews in chapter 4 and in order to show them that their hope was misplaced in the law. Now, relationship with God does not depend, or is it possible, through the law. Paul said the law brings wrath. God's wrath. And so relationship with God depends upon the statement that Jesus made, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So relationship with God is not dependent nor possible through the law. A person must come before God without blemish or flaw if he is depending upon the law. Remember that the law rests upon the Ten Commandments. And if you were to break one commandment, then you've broken them all. Uh, we've talked about this in... in uh, previous studies. So no one is perfect. No human is perfect. The only perfect one is Jesus Christ and that's the reason that he is the door or the passageway to God because of what he did on the cross. Now as we think about the Jewish or Judaism um, point of view, we go back to Genesis and uh, the Old Testament as they uh, initiated the sacrificial system. And uh, even today, the Jewish uh, community still practices the what they call the high holy days and uh, one of the most or the most important day in the year of a jewish person is the day of atonement and that's uh, as we go back to the old testament when it was initiated that was the day that the high priest would go into the holy of holies and the uh, sacrifice would be made there uh, on the in the holy of holies which was first of all for the high priest's forgiveness and atonement for sin then he uh, being cleansed through that ritual would uh, pray for uh, the nation of Israel and the sacrifice there would be made and in order to present a sufficient sacrifice that sacrifice whether it be a lamb or a, a bull or goat whatever it was had to be perfect it had to be without blemish and so um, this set the stage then uh, for Paul as he made his argument that the only sacrifice that God sees is the sacrifice that he made through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son on the cross. 
and the shedding of the blood there on the cross covered our sins. It made atonement for all of our sin. And so the Jews refuted this fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled the prophecy of the Messiah. Uh, they still believed that the Messiah is yet to come. However, some years ago, I was listening to a rabbi who was one of the most influential rabbis in the United States here, make the statement that Jesus Christ was very possible, very possibly the true Messiah. Now, I don't know if he came to full belief of that, but I do know that he made a bold statement. Not many Jews have come to believe in Jesus Christ. Paul had once believed that same Judaistic belief that his relationship with God depended upon his relationship with the law. But Paul had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ. If you studied your New Testament or been to Bible school or, or vacation Bible school, you've probably heard the account of Paul on the Damascus Road as he was on his way to persecute Christians. He met Jesus face to face. This was the risen Lord, the risen Jesus Christ. And in that moment, Paul received Christ as the true Messiah, as his Savior and Lord. And um, so he was able to understand and, and see how uh, Christ and his atonement on the cross superseded all of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. And um, salvation through Jesus Christ was the only way to God. And in fact, Paul is making his argument and, and uh, statement that salvation comes by faith through the grace of God. And only through that process can one know God in a personal way. Well, tonight we're going to begin our study with chapter 5 as Paul continues his treatise on faith. And we're going to see in this context how sin entered into the world and how it caused God to expel Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And the solution to sin. And as I've already mentioned, the Old Testament solution was the sacrificial system that the priests implemented um, as they would offer up a sacrifice of uh, some kind. It could have been a blood sacrifice or a a grain sacrifice or a, a sacrifice of incense. But on that Day of Atonement, it was a blood sacrifice. And for mankind to truly have that a real atonement, God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, to die on the cross and shed His blood as a sacrifice to the world. 
in order that we might be forgiven of our sin. He paid the price for us. So we're going to see what Paul has to say about faith and uh, reconciliation through Jesus Christ. We'll take a short break at this time, and then we'll be right back to dig into Paul's message. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. If you choose to obey the power of sin, it leads to death. If you choose to obey obedience, it leads to righteousness. Forgiveness is just the beginning of life in Christ. God wants us to live for Him now. And because of Jesus Christ, the gospel was preached, and you and I are blessed today because of Abraham. Did you know that? We're blessed. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people not places, especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. The only way we come to know the saviorship of Jesus Christ is by bowing and acknowledging that he is Lord and King over all the earth. Jesus Christ died on a cross, paid the penalty for our sin, and by repenting of our sin and accepting him by faith, what he did for us, we are forgiven. Salvation is not a combination of faith and works. Salvation is by faith alone in God. Experience Truth, 99.3 FM. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. In Romans chapter 5, we'll begin with verses 1 and 2. And we can see in, in Paul's declaration here that faith is triumphant. And uh, if you'll read it with me, uh, the first two verses of the chapter... Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So Paul is summing up basically his statements in uh, chapter 4. Um, talking about faith through Jesus Christ. He presented the truth that we've gained access to God through Christ into the grace upon which our hope of glory, a hope of glory of God, rests. Now, as I said a moment ago, the Jews had placed their trust in the law. Uh, that was their hope in being able to um, have a relationship with God through their obedience to the law. Well, the New Testament teaches us that the law, the Old Testament, was actually the tutor for 
what was coming in the New Testament. The law was very strict and uh, there is no one person that is perfect and can keep all of the law. So Paul was saying it's only by faith in Jesus Christ through the grace of God that we can stand in that grace and be uh, transformed into what God intends us to be except through Christ our Savior and Lord. Um, Paul also states that's not all. We also rejoice in our afflictions. Now, what are these afflictions that Paul is talking about? Well, he, he tells us that um, these afflictions would produce endurance, and that endurance produces proven character, and the proven character produces the hope the relationship with God. These were afflictions that Paul was accustomed. Uh, first, present suffering is intended by God to produce the inner transformation of our character that God has always intended. Um, we, we have an old saying in this day and time that says, what doesn't kill you cures you. Well, that's not exactly what Paul was saying, but what he was saying that all these challenges, these afflictions that come against the Christian is intended by God to strengthen. Strengthen spiritually, strengthen the character of the person, and um, produce that inner transformation from the old person, the old man, to the new man, as Paul talks about in his writings. Um, Christianity is a lifestyle. We are transformed from an old way of life to a new way. As Christ enters into our life as we accept Him as our Savior and Lord, He begins to transform us from the inside out. Um, our way of thinking is changed. Our wants, as someone said, our want to is changed. Um, I was minister in a um, somewhat large church down in uh, the south in Louisiana and um, uh, helped lead a, a man that had just gotten out of prison to relationship with Jesus Christ. And he made the statement that once he had accepted Christ as his Savior, his entire life changed. His want to changed. Instead of uh, drugs and alcohol, he was buying groceries for his family. And this is just a, a, the a typical of the type change that uh, the Holy Spirit can make in a person's life. When a person accepts Christ as Savior and Lord, he immediately receives the Holy Spirit into his life. And the Holy Spirit then is that inner voice that God speaks to us through. Um, he helps to change our thinking and, and want to. And as we depend upon the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in our life. He 
helps us to understand what God has planned for our life, uh, what God has to say to us in His Scripture, in the still small voice. You know, that's the way God speaks to uh, most people, that still small voice that we hear when we get quiet and, and begin to allow God to uh, communicate and speak to us. Well, Paul says that we rejoice in the afflictions uh, that we have and, and we rejoice because it's a growing process. Then secondly, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us pours out God's love in our hearts. There is the inner witness of the Spirit that God does love us as His own. Um, I've counseled with many people who um, felt unloved, felt that they had been abandoned by not just family but society, but worst of all, they felt many times like they'd been abandoned by God. But God tells us that He is with us and will continue to be with us as we have a relationship with Him. Um, God is our spiritual Father. And as we have come into that personal relation through Jesus Christ, it gives us the privilege of calling on Him in that personal way, much as a child would say to the Father as Daddy. Now that sounds a little flippant to talk to God and call Him Daddy, but that's what God wants us to feel as we have that personal relationship that we can come to Him with any little problem, that we can come to Him with any little rejoicing as well as the big things. Um, there's that hope. Um, in verse 5, Paul states, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Um, Scripture tells us that God loves us. God is love. And then thirdly, those declared righteous are reconciled. There is the objective evidence of God's love for us seen in the cross. Christ died for us when we were yet sinners, as the Scripture says, while we still numbered among the ungodly. Surely the one who died for us when we were sinners and saved us from God's wrath will, now that we have been reconciled to God, save us through his life. This is our hope. Hope in God, in Jesus Christ, is not one of those, well, I hope everything works out all right. Um, maybe it will. I just hope so. No, it's not that indefinite um, feeling that we have, but it is a foundation on which we can stand the hope, the hope of glory, the hope of the glory of God is ours through Jesus Christ. In um, verses 6 through 11, Paul goes on to say, For while we were still helpless, at the, at the appointed moment, Jesus died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. 
But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received this reconciliation through him. Well, what does reconcile mean? It means to be brought back into line. It is a banking or accounting term. When you reconcile your checkbook, you bring all of your checks and balances together. And Jesus provided that way of reconciliation between sinful man and God. The ever-living Jesus will keep us and bring us through this life to the glory for which we hope. Um, this was a statement from the teacher's commentary. Now, as we think about where sin entered into the world, we go all the way back to Genesis. And um, let, let's read Romans 5, verses 1 and 2 again. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into his grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Sin negates that hope if there is no forgiveness of that sin. In other words, it acts as a chasm or a, um, a valley, a deep valley between us and God. And Jesus Christ on the cross reconciled our condition through his act of sacrifice, self-sacrifice there on the cross. We were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Um, death is the price of sin, the payment that we all owe because of our sin. Adam brought sin into the world. Um, look at uh, Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and that's Adam, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men, all men, because all sinned. Adam disobeyed God. God told Adam and Eve that they were free to eat of every fruit and um, tree of the Garden of Eden except for one. And that's the very one that Satan, the old serpent, enticed Eve to take of and eat. And she gave it to Adam. And Adam also ate and disobeyed God. Sin entered into the world through that simple act. And because of that, Adam is the firstborn because of that act, 
we all have inherited his sin nature. And to present ourselves to God as perfect, we can't. Because there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who can keep the entire law, who can keep all ten commandments. Uh, Paul himself said that those things that I would do, I, I don't. I fail. Those things that I shouldn't do or wouldn't do, I do. And that is kind of the summation of life of, a, of mankind. We do things that we shouldn't do and, and fail to do the things that we should do. We disobey God. Therefore, we sin against God. And um, in verse 13, he goes on to say, In fact, sin was in the world before the law. But sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. In other words, um, there was no law before uh, God gave the law to Moses. And so those who lived and died before the law was handed down um, were not accounted or not um, under the law. They were not judged as sin because there was no law to define. But once God set down His law, the Ten Commandments, that is the foundation of the law, uh, man became accountable. And repeat of what Paul said, there is none righteous, no, not one. Um, reading on verse thir uh, 14, Paul says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness of Adam's transgression. He is a prototype of the coming one. Adam, the first man, is the prototype of the coming one, the Messiah, the Christ. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift overflowed to the many by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ? And the gift is not like the one man's sin, talking about Adam's sin, because from one sin came the judgment, resulting in condemnation. That one sin that Adam committed condemned all the rest. But from many trespasses came the gift, resulting in justification. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So, Jesus is triumphant over sin. Faith is triumphant in man's life, in a person's life, over sin as he has faith which is given by God. His faith is that thing that brings him into 
uh, uh, knowledge of what God has in store through Jesus Christ. And that faith not only gives us, brings us into the knowledge itself, but brings us to the point of relationship as we express our faith in Jesus Christ, in God. Now, Paul goes on to say, So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is life-giving justification for everyone. Talking about the fact that um, the righteous sacrificial act of Jesus Christ on the cross provided a way for life, life-giving justification for everyone who is willing to believe and put his faith and trust in that person who uh, did the act of sacrifice, and that's Jesus the Christ. The law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also will reign through righteousness, um, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul now begins one of the key passages in Scripture. He goes back to Genesis uh, to remind his audience of how sin entered into the world and the consequences that sin brought to mankind. Sin was credited to Adam and spread to all men because all have sinned. The penalty of sin is death. Yes, there's a consequence. There's a penalty of sin. And uh, as Paul states in his uh, gospel here, or his uh, message letter to the Romans, the penalty of unrepented sin is death. Paul made the case that sin entered into the world before the law, and because the law had not yet been given, sin was not charged to a person's account. Even though no one was charged with sin until the law was given, all were spiritually dead. Thus, death reigned, bringing all humankind under necessary condemnation. You know, if Adam had not sinned, he would not have died because he was there. God had placed Adam and Eve, his mate, in a perfect situation, in a perfect place. Time was not a factor. Um, they would have continued to have lived and, and um, had that personal relationship with God that they had if they had not sinned, disobeyed God. But because they sinned, they broke that fellowship with God. And what happened? God expelled them from the Garden of Eden, that place of perfection, the place where the tree of life uh, was located. Now they, they knew things. They had understanding. Uh, it says that God um, killed animals and clothed them with, their, with the animal's skin. This was uh, the first act of sacrifice uh, because they knew and understood that they were naked. And 
that had not been a problem before, but now they were ashamed. So there had to be a solution for sin, didn't there? Well, Paul is going to continue to talk about this solution. Um, going back to Genesis, he reminds um, the people, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on that day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Jesus has come into the world now bringing a grace gift to all the world. He came to give life and defeat death. What relationship meant with Adam was one of death. What relationship with Jesus means is eternal life and righteousness. The teacher's commentary again states, For just as sin is associated with and expresses spiritual death, so righteousness is associated with and expresses spiritual life. Through Jesus Christ, we come to life again, and our new life will be marked by the reign of righteousness. In the law, we see the reign of death. But in the gift of grace, that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, we see life, life everlasting. And as Paul says, life more abundant. In chapter 6, Verses 1 through 11, Paul says, What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So when Christ becomes our Savior and Lord, we accept Him into our lives. We are filled with the Holy Spirit, we no longer um, live the old life. We live that new life. And it doesn't mean that we don't still have that sin nature within us. It means that we have been forgiven of it. And it means that once we have been saved, we are always saved because Christ died once for all. And to multiply grace by continuing sin, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, it brings us to the question, well, if we have been forgiven and it's uh, eternal forgiveness, then we can continue to do anything we want to. Well, if that is your desire, then you probably have not received Christ as your Savior because your desires will change. Um, he goes on to say, Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. For if we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. 
For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished, so that we may no longer be enslaved by sin. Have you ever thought about it that way? Uh, sin enslaves the person who continues to live a lifestyle of sin. We become slaves to virtually Satan because Satan is the father of sin. But in Jesus Christ, we become free from sin. We become slaves of God. We choose to do that. Since a person has died, is freed from sin's claims, um, he goes on to say, let me read that in uh, connection with the previous verse. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's dominion or control over the body may be abolished so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is freed from sin's claims. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. In other words, Christ defeated death. For in light of the fact that he died, he died to sin once for all. But in light of the fact that he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is our hope of glory, the glory of God. Jesus died on the cross once for all, once for all sin. It's the free gift that God has presented to mankind. And as I think I said last week, a free gift that is presented to a person has to be accepted in order for the gift to become theirs. That's the way it is with salvation. God has prepared that gift, that free gift of salvation for mankind. Not everyone is going to accept that free gift. Those who receive the gift become free from the dominion, the domination, uh, the control of sin. Those who reject God's gift of Christ Jesus, His only begotten Son, they have no hope. That's what the Bible says. For the light, uh, for in light of the fact that He died, He died to sin once for all, but in light of the fact that He lives, He lives to God. So you too Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. In this passage, Paul employs a form of writing called the diatribe, in which he inserts objections which an imaginary opponent may make and then answers them. Uh, through this form, Paul raised an important question. What shall we conclude from this promise of a salvation by faith and an imputed righteousness? 
Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, is salvation, the assurance of forgiveness, a license to sin? And then he answers that question by saying, absolutely not. Or as others might even say, since our sin seems to give God the chance to display his grace, shall we go on sinning so that even greater displays of grace might take place? Paul responded to this idea with an exclamation, absolutely not. Paul then emphatically continued by stating, we died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Paul's exclamation and the verses which immediately follow are the key to understanding the victory over sin which Jesus Christ has won for us. There are different ideas of the victorious Christian life, and uh, here I'm going to list four of them. Uh, these are four of the main ideas. Um, number one, um, living the victorious life, um, some believe is a means of eradication. This is the idea that the captivity or the capacity of sin is removed. In other words, we no longer have any desire to sin. Well, we know that is not the fact. Uh, Paul tells us later on uh, that we continue to have that sin nature within us. Then the uh, a second idea is suppression. Accordingly, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she is given the power to control the sin nature. The capacity and the desire for sin are still there, but the Christian it, um, has the responsibility to hold down that desire. This implies a certain amount of emphasis placed on the law. In other words, we must obey the law are, um, we no longer have a relationship with God. Well, a third idea is self-crucifixion. This implies a save today or lost tomorrow uh, concept. Uh, the idea is for the Christian to live the crucified life each temptation calls for renewed surrender to God. This is a life that, as far as I think, is a life robbed of the joy of our salvation because we continually, um, so to speak, looking over our shoulder. And we're continually... Um, having to accept Christ's gift, God's gift of salvation over and over and over for every sin that we um, remember. Well, what about those sins that we don't remember? Those that we uh, didn't mean to make? Well, a fourth idea is called penalism. This approach views all temptations as attacks of Satan. It always, it's always the fault of Satan that we uh, fall into temptation. Uh, there used to be a, a comedy show on television years ago. Uh, those of you that are... Um, probably 30 or 40 and younger will not remember it. But it was called the Flip Wilson Show. And one of his favorite sayings was, the devil made me do it. Well, Scripture tells us that the devil, Satan, can't make us do anything. He can tempt us just as he tempted Christ. 
He can tempt us in many, many ways, but he can't make us succumb to that temptation. Uh, we choose to do that. However, Paul taught in his passage a different approach than any of these four ideas. He taught us a new, a unique understanding of what did happen on the cross. And Paul taught us a unique way to respond when we sense sin's inner pull, that sin nature within us tugging at us, a way that promises a freedom such as we have never known. This way of release is based on the realization that Christ's work on the cross, our sin nature, was rendered powerless. Let me read that again. This way of release is based on the realization that Christ's work on the cross and our sin nature, uh, because of that, is rendered powerless. It still exists and it still pulls us toward evil, but we do not have to respond. We are no longer slaves to sin. Temptation is alive and well. Uh, we see it around us every day, in every walk of life. Every place we turn, we can see temptation. Satan is alive and well in our world. It's a spirit world. And Christ is also alive and very well and stands at the right hand of the Father ever interceding on our behalf and the Holy Spirit is alive within each Christian empowering that person to resist the lure and temptation of the devil. We need to claim that promise in order to live the abundant life that Paul talks about later on in his writing. To believe in Christ is to believe in the power of God in our life. Because through Christ, through the sending of the Holy Spirit at the time of our salvation, we are empowered that we might accept the power that God has given us over sin. Now, we don't always do that. Um, like Paul, things that I shouldn't do, I do. Those things that I should do, want to do, I don't. But God has given us the power to resist Satan. Satanless is powerless before God. And as Satan approaches each Christian, all we have to do is allow Christ to stand between us and Him. And Satan becomes powerless before Christ, before God. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and He will be there supplying our every need. He is our strength. He is our refuge. I hope He's yours. Next week, um, I will be out of town, so you will see a rerun of one of our earlier studies. But the following Friday, I'll be back and we'll continue to look at um, uh, Romans and we will begin our studies with chapter 7. 
So um, that'll give you time to do a little extra study on your own, I hope. And I hope you have a great week this week, and may God bless you as you continue your journey in a faith-filled life, faith that works. Good night.